850th webinar of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. That's right. The Bar Association of Sri Lanka reaches a historic milestone today with the conducting of 150 webinars accumulating over the four webinar series. So to commemorate this very special occasion, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka Seminars Committee has published a BASL Webinars Digest, listing all the webinars up to date with hyperlinks to all the sessions. Very convenient in indeed. So you can simply a word search the e-document, click on the topic you wish to access and refresh your knowledge. Uh, and just like that, with the click of a button, it will direct you to the session online. So as you all know, uh, the English webinar series is conducted every Saturday usually at 5.30 p.m. and has now concluded 68 webinars. Then we have the singular webinar series every Tuesday at 7 p.m., which has completed 38 webinars. The Tamil webinar series is held every Thursday at 7 p.m. and will be reaching 20 webinars next week. And the fourth series, that is the Professional Personal Career Development webinar series, uh, reaches 24 webinar series. And that brings us to today's historic event, that is the 150th webinar. Uh, in a time where social distancing and work from home have become the norm, this series of webinars brought to you by the BASL has been nothing short of informative and has been an easy source of learning, which has been accessible to all, uh, be it around the country or even the globe. The BASL webinar series, bring, being the brainchild of our dynamic secretary of the BASL, Mr. Rajiv Amarasuriya, was conducted last year under his office as secretary. And this year, it is organized by the seminars committee of the BASL, also chaired by Ms. Samara Surya with the convener assistant secretary, Mr. Pasindu Silva, and the co-conveners, Mr. Pandula Vanya Rachi, Mr. Oshan Ubeyaratna, Ms. Ann Devananda, and Ms. Nikini Mapitigana. Um, even though it seems very simple to us and it is accessible to all of us very easily, Conducting four weekly series has been no easy task. It requires meticulous planning, including putting together an eminent panel of experts in the particular area of law, uh, conducting technical trial sessions, coordinating with the expert panelists, moderators and compeers, a lot of promotional work and real-time technical problem solving. Um, now, these are only some of the efforts made behind the scenes for each webinar. And this success, of course, would not have been possible if not for the hard work and the coordinating and planning by the secretary's office and, of course, the seminars committee of the BASL. Um, so I would like to particularly take this opportunity to specially thank the BASL and the chairman of the seminars committee, the BASL secretary, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuriya, uh, the convener of the seminars committee, Assistant Secretary, Mr. Pasno Silva, the co-conveners, Mr. Uh, Pandulavani Arachi, Mr. Oshan Tarko Beratna, Ms. Ann Devananda, and Ms. Nikini Mapitigama once again. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the president of the BASL, Mr. Salia Pedis, President's Council, immediate past president of the BASL, Mr. Kalinga in the Thista President's Council, and the other members of the two management committees of the BSL for all the support and the guidance given. Uh, throughout these past few months, we've seen some of the most brilliant legal minds in the country share with you their knowledge and experience. Uh, today is no different, but a very special as the focus of today's webinar is slightly different as we celebrate <laughs> 150 webinars. So today's topic uh, for the 150th webinar is on the illustrious journeys in the legal practice. Uh, let me repeat the topic of today. The topic for today is illustrious journeys in the legal practice. Uh, before we proceed, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to warmly welcome our distinguished panel for this evening comprising of Mr. Ramesh Jisilwa, President's Council, Mr. Nihal Jayamana, President's Council, 
Mr. Srinath Pereira, President's Council, Mr. Ikram Mohammed, President's Council, and moderated by our moderator for the evening, Mr. Krishmal Varnasubria, Attorney at Law. Uh, while these legal luminaries need no further introduction because their reputation precedes them, I would be failing in my duty if I don't provide at least a brief introduction. Uh, so let me take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, today's star started panel. I lost her. <laughs> yes. So um, first and foremost, uh, let me welcome uh, our panel. And our first panelist will be Mr. Ramesh De Silva, President's Council. Mr. De Silva obtained his LLB from the University of Ceylon and was awarded a postgraduate diploma from The Hague. He was appointed a President's Council over 30 years ago and presently has a leading civil, commercial and administrative law practice in both the original and appellate courts. Mr. Ramesh De Silva, President's Council, is the present chairman of the Law Commission of Sri Lanka, which is responsible for proposing, directing, and guiding legal reform in the country. He is also a former chairman of the Sri Lanka National Arbitration Center. He is a former president of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Mr. De Silva has functioned as a chairman of the Advisory Committee of Intellectual Property, which drafted the present Intellectual Property Act number 36 of 2003. Mr. Ramesh De Silva was appointed life member honoris causa by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and has received the award of excellence from his alma mater, St. Joseph's College, Colombo 10. Mr. De Silva has been featured as one of the leading counsel in Sri Lanka for many years. Right, next we have with us and would like to warmly welcome on board Mr. Nihal Jayamana, President's Council. Mr. Nihal Jayamana had his education at St. Joseph's College, Colombo. He qualified to enter the University of Colombo to follow a Bachelor of Science degree course in Physical Science. However, he opted to follow in his father's footsteps and pursue a career in law. He was elected the president of the Law Students Union in 1969 and passed out as an advocate in the same year. He took his oaths as an advocate of the Supreme Court of Ceylon in June 1970. He was appointed a member of Law Commission in 1994. Mr. Jayamana continued to serve as a member of the Law Commission from 1994 to 2010, when he was appointed as its chairman and he functioned as such till January 2015. He was appointed in 1995 as a President's Council. He is a former President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka and he was appointed as an Executive Director of Air Lanka and Air Lanka Catering in 1994. He was also, uh, he was also the Chairman of the Law College Foundation and served as a member of the Advisory Commission appointed under the Companies Act and subsequently served as its Chairman. He has also served as a director of Ceylon Bank. Mr. Jayaman has also been a member of the Council of Legal Education and a member of the Advisory Council of Tourists of the Asia Pacific Forum for the Advancement of Human Rights. He was a commissioner of the Telecommunications Regulatory Commission and also a commissioner of the Independent Police Commission. Mr. Jayamana was the president of Sark Law, Sri Lanka chapter, till the end of 2018. He remains a member of the executive committee of Sark Law and also a vice president. He is also an artist, a poet, and he loves music and he also loves to sing. He has, had a, he has had an exhibition of his paintings in 1996, and three of his paintings were selected to be exhibited in a book introducing 50 prominent post-independent artists of Sri Lanka. In 2007, he was the recipient of the Josephian Award of Excellence in the field of law. Next, I would like to uh, warmly welcome and introduce to you all Mr. Srinath Pereira, President's Council. Mr. Pereira was educated at St. Joseph's College and joined Law College thereafter. He gave oaths in 1973. He thereafter joined the Attorney General's Department as a State Counsel in the year 1974 
where he served for about 22 years, making his way up. When he left the department in December 1996, he was the senior most additional Solicitor General. While he served as at the Attorney General's department, he read for his LLM at the University of London. Mr. Pereira was conferred silk in 1994. He was a lecturer and an examiner at the Sri Lanka Law College and has also lectured at the University of Muratua, University of Kalania, University of Sri Jayawardenepura, and the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Uh, the next luminary I would like to uh, welcome on board and introduce is Mr. Ikram Mohammed, President's Council. Ms. Sikram Mohammed, President's Council, holds an LLB with honors from the University of Ceylon, Colombo. He obtained a first class honors at the last advocate final examination held at the Law College and was admitted to the bar in 1974. Having apprenticed under Mr. B.J. Fernando, President's Council, Mr. Mohammed also was a junior to Mr. B.J. Fernando. He continued to build up a civil practice both in Colombo and outstation. He was also an assistant lecturer of law in the Faculty of Law at the University of Colombo and a visiting lecturer at the faculty from 1974 to 1987. He is a civil practitioner both in the original and appellate courts and was appointed as a president's counsel in the year 1998. Mr. Mohammed was elected as the president of the Bar Association as well. Finally, let me introduce to you our moderator for today, and that is Mr. Krishmal Varnasurya, attorney at law. Mr. Varnasurya studied at St. Thomas's College. Uh, he obtained a master's degree in law from King's College, UK, and was thereafter granted conversion to the UK bar. He also holds a bachelor's degree in political science, international relations, and journalism from the University of Colombo, and a postgraduate diploma in international relations, political science, and conflict resolutions from the BCIS. He is a life member of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka, a member of the International Bar Association, and the Association of Sri Lankan Lawyers UK. He was awarded the Outstanding Young Persons Award in 2008 for legal accomplishments. His areas of practice include human rights and constitutional law, public law, criminal appeals, and civil and commercial laws, and, in, and industrial laws. In United Kingdom, he provides services as a consultant in international law under the authority of Law Society England and Wales. He lectures at several institutions, including the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine. He is also the founder of Citizens Action Network, consultant expert of the Legal Aid Project Faculty of Law, Colombo, a Joint Secretary People's Intellectual Assembly, convener of the Anti-Corruption Project Transparency International, national convener of the Ratasurakimu Initiative. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this will be your panel for today. Without further ado, I would like to hand over the session to our moderator. I hope all of you have an enjoyable session. Over to you, Mr. Varasuriya. Thank you very much, uh, Umayangi. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, after that very comprehensive introduction of our very, very illustrious panel, uh, which I am honored um, to host this evening and moderate, uh, I do not think uh, uh, much is needed to be said uh, about the, the creme de la creme of Halstor that's before you this evening. So um, I am reminded just to, uh, just to uh, put some uh, break some eyes of uh, an old uh, anecdote that's said in cricketing circles when a particular umpire gave a world famous batsman out, I think the WG Grace. And when he walked up to the umpire and said, Why aren't you walking out? He told the umpire, Well, people have come here to watch me bat, not to watch you umpire. So therefore, I don't think any of you are here to watch me moderate, but to but to actually listen to our illustrious panel. Uh, that's that's due to address you. But before I, before I venture there, may I once again compliment on behalf of all of us, the Bar Association, particularly for this continuous lecture series, which has, which has been seen as something that we needed, as we all know, across the globe. Uh, just because you pass out as a lawyer, you can't practice. You need to be continuously professionally developed. You need to have a practicing certificate. And this has been lacking in our country for a while. So although it's not regulated as such in Sri Lanka yet, maybe it will get there one day. But we must compliment your, your continuous uh, professional development seminars committee, uh, 
for convening that. And what better way uh, to, to celebrate a good 150 seminars than with, with this uh, illustrious panel? Uh, I am. I also noted from the introduction that we have three Josephians, Mr. Mohammed, uh, Mr. Sina Pereira, who is unfortunately not here with us, who is also a Josephian. So we are outnumbered, uh, I think, this evening. Uh, and maybe all wish Mr. Sina Pereira very well, although he can't join us this evening uh, due to um, some um, some ailment. We all wish him well, and we hope that the bar will uh, get him to join in uh, at some time in the near future. So, as I said, without any further ado, may I open uh, this session out to our panelists, starting um, with uh, Mr. Ramesh Dissil, if I may. But I will pose the same question to all three of you, so I don't necessarily need to ask each one individually over and over again. And once again, sirs, uh, please feel free to jump in and add to anything to add to a question, uh, because I, I think that, that I don't need to necessarily ask you. If you feel that you need to add something, please, uh, uh, please. Uh, put your uh, put your comments in, and and that's more than welcome, sir. There are lots of juniors may wish to know, particularly with the competition that's around in the bar. We have five six hundred people joining every six months. I'm told thousands every <coughs> sorry thousands every year. What is it that made you pick the bar? Was it already ordained for you uh, as you were growing up that you would somehow move into the laws, or or Mr. Diesel, if I may start with you. What was it that made you pick a practice at the bar? I think from school days, I wanted to be a lawyer. There was no second thinking. Uh, I really don't know why, but I always wanted to be a lawyer. And I achieved my ambition when I passed out and took over 1975. And was it, do you, do you uh, for, the, for the benefit of our juniors who are watching, you come from a legal background where, where your family and, and everyone else uh, was involved in a practice or was it that something that you yourself wanted? Well, it was something that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. To ask me, my father was a lawyer, so was my grandfather and a lot of other relations were lawyers. But I don't think that inspired me. What I wanted to do was law. I was interested in the law. I was interested in practice. I have seen great in school, while well, school like Dr. Colvin Adi Silva and uh, people on their feet, Mr. Gigi Pondamblam. And I like to be one of them, not that I can ever aspire to be Colvin Adi Silva, one of our most brilliant men in the country. But I was inspired and I wanted to do law and uh, I did law. May I serve with the utmost respect as a junior savior, your if not halfway or three fourth of the way there, you, I, I think we all look up to you as a leader of the bar. But may I pose the same question to Mr. Jayaman, sir? I know you also came from a legal background, but but for the benefit of our juniors, uh, the, uh, and and I also know uh, for a fact that that you didn't practice under the senior, you moved into practice yourself. You want to elaborate a little bit of, of your entry to the bar? Well, my father, father was a lawyer, uh, but. Uh, at school, I did the science, and actually, I wanted to be an engineer. But then, uh, all of a sudden, although I got entrance to the to do a physical science degree, double maths and physics, all of a sudden, I um, decided that I will do law. I don't know why, but I did, and uh, I entered law college because my father said, if you want to do law. There's no point in you doing a physical science degree, uh, spending three years and then another three years at law college. You might as well cut down three years and enter law college straight away. So I entered law college and, uh, well, I was uh, enrolled as an advocate uh, in 1970, I think one year before Omesh, in July, June uh, 1970. Of course, at, at law college, I I was also involved in uh, uh, social activities and a bit of politics in it, and uh, was elected the chair of our law students union president. Of those those days, it was not a virulent society like it is uh, these days. It was a quite a <laughs> decent uh, 
decent society and uh, the ragging of the freshers was uh, just having a freshers debate where you get all the freshers to come and uh, get on the stage and speak some give a speech and uh, the seniors used to throw tomatoes and rotten eggs at the fellow and we all had great fun so uh, well i i must say that i enjoyed my stay at law college so and uh, and as you mentioned that i'll come to that later on uh, for the moment that's it that's that's what motivated me to become a lawyer hello you are not uh ms jaman and, and i don't know if you can hear me um i can uh, yeah and until uh, until he does uh, join us again uh, mr mohammed was was uh, mr ikram mohammed president council was law preordained for you as well or, or was it a conscious choice or uh, how was your entry to the bar it was my conscious choice because my father was a lawyer in gambu and all on sun saturdays i used to go to his office and he inspired me although he did not want to be want me to become a lawyer saying that the legal profession may not have a future in this country but uh, i decided to do law then he okayed and i must still confess that this generation of lawyers including all of us have done very much better than our fathers and forefathers in the profession and that was a very conscious choice And as Mr. Mitchell just said, I also could not have imagined of any other profession. So I was very happy when I joined the law faculty. I knew that my aim will be achieved, and thank God, we have uh, succeeded to an extent in the profession. And I must thank God. So may I just pick you on that? Um, now, uh, as I said, I will I will bowl a few full tosses and a few yorkers. Uh, during this discussion just to make it lively for the audience now mr de silva said that he saw certain people uh, he mentioned a few names like the great dr colina de silva who inspired him uh, to to you know to to aspire to be that so was there any reason uh, for you to to other than the fact that your father was a lawyer and you went on saturdays and saw the practice was there any reason that motivated you to come to the law yes yes but i feel that was a profession which could assist the uh, the poor uh, category of our society and to and to be, that we could fight for their cause not that i was not conscious of the fact that we could earn a good living from the profession but uh, what motivated was frankly my daddy that is a profession and his conduct as a lawyer which i thought was very honorable in nigambo and that right. on that, and i thought this a very honorable profession and i thought that i could Uh, I must be a member of such a honourable profession. So I, I can, if I can, just move on from there, from on that very point of honourable profession, uh, Mr. Ramesh Dilla, President Council. So we speak of honour, and and we speak of how we come to a noble profession. Uh, if you could perhaps elucidate to 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 our juniors watching, particularly the juniors watching, why is it noble? Why why why? is it that we speak so much of ethics and integrity and 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 in this noble profession is it as you as you found it sir when when you all came to the bar or have there has there been a disintegration of it or or a deep or a, or a depreciation or or going down a bit from that now and and where do you see us now from from where you came in sir to the profession well i think the main thing that uh, we have to keep in mind is the difference between a profession and a trade <clears throat> for me law is a profession and not a trade and ikram and i come from the same stables bjf and n2 stables and we were trained there to treat it as a profession so there we were taught you know that to how to behave in the courtroom we were taught that in the courtroom all persons junior or senior alike are the same so whether when you apply a pf for the plaintiff and the defendant it matters not whether it's a silk or a junior you are the same to have that attitude and to go into court like that 
you defer to seniors out of court. You defer to seniors till the case starts. You may give your seat to a senior. We were told never to sit in the front row of the bar table till our case was taken up. But once the case started, we were told all are equal and you appear for your client, do your best. Secondly, we were taught both Ikram and I that nothing, no anger should be taken out of the courtroom. All what is said in the court remains at the door of the court and never ever must be taken out. Then we've also thought of the difference between short term and long term practice, but I, that doesn't answer your question. Maybe later I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. But we were always told, do your work, do whatever is given to you. Don't worry about your fees. Fees will come when it comes. But the main and essential part is to do your work, do it conscientiously, do it to the best of your ability. Don't exploit people. And remember that this is a profession and not a trade. If you want to earn money, go and become a trader. You know, but here, the first and foremost is the duty to court, the duty to your client, the duty to yourself. And I think both Krem and I were, that was drilled into us, together with discipline with a capital D. And Ikram will also remember that our boss, our guru, DJ Fernando told us, you know, if I give you a draft, I expect it to be given in 24 hours. Right, sir. The, at the latest. And don't come and tell me that your mother died and I couldn't do it because that's an excellent excuse, but an excuse all the same. So both of us were trained there. We worked hard and that's how we are where we are. We got no patronage, either personal or professional. We worked very hard. We followed what BJ told us. And that is how we have made the profit. We have behaved in the way of a profession. And then nobility follows. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, 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 there's nothing to add to that except to compliment you on that answer because that, uh, unfortunately, we as, as relative juniors um, see at times some of those things that you said uh, uh, lacking. But as you said, we can come to that later. Uh, Mr. Jayaman, going on that, uh, just if I can just ask you to uh, slightly uh, go on a different area of that. As a senior, for a, for a junior joining your chamber, what do you expect? What would you expect the junior who may be coming in as an apprentice? As, as, as all of us know, uh, as I said before, thousands pass out every year and the, 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 the area in chambers are limited, particularly those in Colombo. Uh, sir, what, uh, Ms. Yaman, what do you expect from a junior that comes into your chamber? I mean, the first thing I would expect is for him to be emotional, uh, to be honest, so that I can trust him and rely on him and not be, you know, weary of him. Uh, I must be sure of my juniors because uh, lots of things can happen in one chamber. There are documents, there's uh, evidence which we know will be used, and these can be. Uh, this can be uh, sold, you know. <laughs> if you are a dishonest chap, you can you can sell your seniors' briefs, documents. I, it, it has happened to several seniors. So I don't want unless I unless they are, I, I am sure that I can trust them. I will never have them as my junior. In, in fact, uh, after a couple of weeks or sometimes within days, I have uh, asked some people to leave my chambers. So that is uh, that is what I expect most. Then, of course, hard work and conscientious uh, work. Those things are natural. I mean, they flow in any profession or any 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 game. You have to work very hard and uh, uh, show your work. And uh, going from what Ramesh uh, said, uh, I didn't have the benefit of benefit of a senior. I never had a senior. I started started practicing on my own from the very first day. I took my oaths. Of course, I had the I had the privilege of my father and uh, the other seniors with whom I mingled because of my father's connections, who had from whom I have learned 
a lot of things, a lot of good things. And as Ramesh said, most of what Mr. B.J. Fernando had told both of even Ram and him are just traditions, good traditions of the bar. Those two good traditions of the bar are there, and it is uh, it is available to everybody. So uh, you're lucky if your senior inculcates them into you, and you are lucky if you have learned it. And Romesh and Nikram have learned it from their father and parents, like like me. So I have uh, I have learned the good things in the profession, how to behave, how to conduct to myself. Uh, it, it actually it came uh, it came to me quite naturally. I didn't uh, I didn't have to learn it because it was just uh, in me how to behave and. Uh, that's how I I I I, I learned. That's what, I am. You, that's that's what, what you would look. For. I expect. That's why I start to expect my juniors all to also to be not not to do it because I am telling them to do it. I want them to do it because it's the right thing to do. Because so as, as, as 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 a, a person is noble only if he is good. If you are not good, you are you, know, you can be of any birth. But if you are not good, you are not noble. To be noble, you have to be good. That is what I have been told by my father. So I I, I try to endeavor to be good, and uh, hopefully I will not fall. Now that I have come to the last the last twenty five years of the of a century. Uh, Let's. I wish that I will go on like that. That Thank is you, that is all my juniors. We all these traditions of giving seniors seniors get a seat in that. All those things are good qualities. They are good qualities. They are necessary qualities because you have to respect your seniors. Not because they are successful, because they are senior to you. So. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I think Thank you, all sir. of us. I don't know. I not one thing I have to say is this: that whether the current generation or how the lawyers uh, know this or want to know this, I'm not too sure because uh, I find, unfortunately, that their prime intention is to make money and not to make a name. You must make a name. I was, I was going to come to that in a moment, sir. <laughs> As Mr. Dishil also sort of. <laughs> On it, uh, 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 but now that you've said it, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly come around to that point. But thank you. But uh, summing up for the moment on this very important aspect of what it is to means to belong to this noble profession of ethics and integrity, the sum total of what all three of you said, whether Mr. Dissil and Mr. Mohammed came from Mr. Fernando's chamber or whether you learned it from your father and your background, sir, there is still, as you said last, there is still that vacuum, isn't it? Or a lacuna where a, 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 a daughter or a son who does not get the privilege of joining such a chamber and having such a senior to train or having that background that you spoke of where there are those habits are inculcated into them from their school or birth. There is still that area that we must perhaps look at, at, at possibly training. I don't know whether you can train these things, but there is a vacuum for someone who doesn't come from that background or who doesn't have access to such a chamber, who still ends up maybe in the Supreme Court with a brief, uh, that, that that person may not know uh, what is expected of them. And, 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 and so do you want to, any of you want to just come in there before I go yeah, to the Yeah, I'd like point? to come in there because uh, if you look at uh, our, uh, either Ikram or me and perhaps Nihal, you will realize that lots of our juniors have not come from these privileged backgrounds that you're talking of. And in fact, from Ikram's chambers, uh, today a very prominent president's council is very fond of saying that he came to Colombo, he knew nobody. He saw Ikram arguing, he went up to him and said, can I join your chambers? And Ikram had said yes, and today he's a prominent president's council. I don't know whether I should mention his name or not, but, uh, but uh, that's... So this mis there's a common misnomer that you can join prominent chambers only if you have a background of a family 
or a school. That is not so. That is not necessarily so. It's lots of the, I mean, I'm not saying Nihal also, but Ikram and I sit next to each other in Halstov. We know that lots of the people at our table have not come from the sort of background that you have come from. Not a Tomi in education, <laughs> all that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I'm so I say that that has to be corrected in some way. <coughs> Uh, thank you, sir. No, that's, that's very important for, for the juniors watching that you don't necessarily have to be born as a local. Going from what Romain said, uh, Kishmal, yeah. from what Romain said, uh, in fact, I think that it is, it is our duty as seniors to give a helping hand to the non privileged people, you know, coming from the village with a not a not a, not a Josephian or a Thomian or a Royalist or a Anandian. Right, but but people coming from some village school, but who have who have reached that stage, it is you know how difficult it is to get into law college. It is just passing that entrance exam, thousands and thousands <coughs> sit and how many people have chosen. You must, you must appreciate what a lot of effort they have done and what a lot of sacrifices their parents have made financially. So you, it is our duty, I think, to um, have in our chambers that. If possible, yes. some of these people and and uh, and give them a chance. Only, only yes. give them a chance. Thank you, sir. I thank you, thank you, very much. Thank, thank you, you We we, yes. we do that. I don't have any prominent uh, parents, children in my chamber. Yes. yes. Before I, I I want to sort of break the ice a little bit and move to a more lighthearted area and then then come back to some serious points. But 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 since Mr. Dizilla made that indictment that I come from a privileged background. May I just say that <laughs> I had to sit in Mr. Mustafa's chambers for about six and a half hours until he finally finished all his plans. And so I said, what do you want? And so I said, I want you to argue. And I, I'd like to apprentice with you. So, <laughs> so that was no privilege for me also, sir. But, no, no, uh, but no. You're from, you're from St. Thomas's <laughs> College. Not that I think yes. it's a very good school, but still that's a privileged <laughs> background. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, let's we that are talking about people who are not, not to, on a serious note, we are talking about people yeah. who are not, you know, as Nihal said, either Josephian, <laughs> Royalists, I don't Absolutely. know why you include some other schools. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. In fact, Ishmael, in fact, Ishmael, <laughs> when I wanted to join Mr. B.J. Fernando, he, yes, he did not even ask from where I come, what's the school I attended. He just saw me and he said, yes, he can come and join me from tomorrow. But that, was yeah. not, that is not the case with most of the seniors. I know some seniors say you might get a first class, you might get an honors pass. But Mr. B.J. Fernando, he just took up for what uh, I was. And then he trained, I think, both people, many people like Romesh and me. And thanks to him, I must confess that uh, all of us are doing fairly well in the profession. If you take the person, even I don't think, I don't go through their background, the school, I just see a person and then take it, take him. Or, and so far, it has been good, except for one few, one incident. Mr. Romney is in the head paper for me in the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I would move on from there. Sir, uh, uh, just to make it a bit lighthearted, I'd like you to think back on a, on an answer. I know I'm your, all three of you, between the three of you, must have several. But one unforgettable memory in a courtroom. Uh, maybe a tussle with a judge or with a with a senior or or something. Uh, can all three of you think? I'll, I'll start with Mr. Jayaman, uh, and then I'll maybe come to Mr. Mohammed and Mr. Dishila. One unforgettable memory in a courtroom that that you want to share with, with people watching, Mr. Jayaman. <laughs> Without compromise, compromising uh, certain judges, it'll be difficult for me to do that. But for the <laughs> sake of uh, sake of uh, uh, for the uh, uh, juniors, I might, uh, I will uh, rec uh, 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 talk of two incidents. One was when, when I was appearing in a case uh, in the Supreme Court before the, before the Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Chief Justice one of the chief justices, uh, 
uh, it was a a difficult case but i was very certain that i had a good case and it was something to do with a matrimonial issue so uh, when i was arguing uh, the chief justice told me mr jayamana in this case we are not going to give judgment according to law but according to our heart so i was rather taken aback and angry and uh, i told him if i wanted the judgment from the heart i would have asked my wife so <laughs> i have my wife my wife was after argument the leave was not given it was a two to one decision two to one decision and uh, when the decision was given i stood up and i stood up and i said i bow to the minority decision sat down and i the left court so i thought it was rather rude of me to have said it subsequently but it just came out of my mouth some uh, two weeks or one week later i think it was a footlight dinner i met this judge i met the uh, chief judge and uh, he was having a had a scotch in his hand and i had a scotch in my hand i walked up to him and i wanted to tell him that i i you know i didn't, uh, i might have been rude but before i could say anything he just ah hello nihal and he started talking about various other things and he, he never mentioned this incident at all now that is the caliber of judge i i admire because uh, he knew i am an advocate and i am i'm i'm passionate about my case and these things happen not that i mean to hurt him but it is just happens rome should have done it from i don't ikram won't do that um, but uh, <laughs> 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 I don't think what we should do. <laughs> He's too polite. He's too polite. He's too polite. Right. I can remember another incident. I think Romesh. Sorry, I, I can remember another another incident. I think Romesh was also in court that day. I was arguing in court before again another Supreme Court judge. I mean, sorry, the Chief Justice. And uh, this was in the afternoon. And uh, while in the course of the argument. the chief justice told me mr jayaman huh? do you know that your clients need about 150000 rupees a day for their ex- daily expenses and also have have you seen the, the antique furniture in their house so i <laughs> there are nothing to do with the case so i i said no will not i i bow to your superior knowledge about my client income and my manager because i have never been to his house and i don't go to a client's houses so that, that was the, that was the, that and then uh, and I, that subsequently in the course of the time he also said me mr jaman and you know that in this in, in this uh, case there is a, a some russians in town who are who, who want to do a project in this that is converting uh, uh, converting garbage into electricity or some something like that so they are also i said milad i gain bowed to your superior knowledge about the russians in the country because there are russians and russians you know what i mean because <laughs> we there are there were these russian women all over the bloody place so so that also i said and uh, i can remember rumesh coming and telling me subsequently he rang me up and said that uh, Something. Can you remember that uh, incident, Romesh? No, not really, not really. No. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. If I can, uh, I, I, I think we can all. Say, uh, which you don't. I mean, I'm not saying that you should. You you should do these things. You do those things without without being sure that you can carry it through. If you can't carry it through, you should never dare. You will be charged with contempt, and you will be out of practice for about ten years. Thank you, sir. I'm 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 sure at least. If that happens, there are three seniors here who will come to our rescue, <laughs> sir. If I can just put the same question to Mr. Mohammed, sir, do yes. you want to share something that that of happened course, in, yes. a, in of, the Roman Empire? Of course, of course, yes. <laughs> And what I am trying to say would also show as to how our seniors uh, conduct themselves in court towards the juniors. 
once I was before the district court in Colombo, and uh, Mr. Nimal Senanayaka was against me. And uh, when he told the, the additional district judge that my client, who was also actor, his the client was also actors, that my client has taken up a hand and had made allegations against an order delivered in respect of uh, uh, tenancy rights in the other case by the by district judge, Mr. Vignaraja. And Mr. Vignaraja, in his case, he, he has given and he has said the other rights will be decided in this case. So I told this judge, no, no, no not here. Yeah, my client had not done anything, but Mr. Vignaraja, his owner has very intelligently left this matter open for your honor to decide. So when I told court, he has decided he had left this matter intelligently open. For your honor to decide, he got a bit annoyed thinking that I was passing a sarcastic remark towards uh, the district judge, Mr. Vignaraja. He lost his temper. He looked at me and said, Mr. Counsel, you are, are you sarcastic? I said, no. He said, you are so annoyed. He said, I will take, I will put off all the other cases and take this matter up. And the front row was closed, packed with all the seniors. I was a junior for about who I put in the boat five to six years. Then he put off all the cases and took my case first. And then I once again, I apologized to court, sir, I never meant to be sarcastic. I tender unconditional apology and I withdraw my statement. You know, then Mr. Nivan Sinanayaka stood up and said, I know Mr. Muhammad, he will never make a sarcastic remark to court. And he stood for me and he came to defend me. And that was the quality of the senior and I was a raw junior against him. He took up the case. He went on, this was an inquiry into the interim injunction. Those days, Ramesh, we used to lead evidence. Yeah. So he led the evidence. Why leading the evidence? Mr. Nimal Senayaka referred to Mr. Vignaraja's judge order, judgment saying, a Vinisha Karya get the endure. The word yeah. used by Mr. Senayaka was Vinisha Karya, that once again annoyed the judge. He was looking at both of us. There was print of silence. Mr. Senak realized there was something wrong. He said, sorry, Your Honor. He finished a car at And he went on till 12.30. He adjourned. And he said, we'll resume at 1.30. In the meantime, he called for me into his chambers. He told, see, Mr. Muhammad, now after Mr. Felix has, has ruined our profession, we are trying to come over, get back to the same position. See, the such seniors are referring to the judge as Vinisha Karya, Paul Kadana, something like that. So I told, in the absence of Mr. Sendanayaka, also he, he, they are English qualified. And they are said, said that was obviously a mistake. That is why he apologized. And I defended Mr. Sendanayaka in his absence in the chambers. So, and thereafter, he came to court. And then in court, I told, that reference was accidental, Your Honor, as I know, Mr. Senanak. We went on with the case, and finally he dismissed that application for want of an affidavit. <laughs> so that, that was a thing I will never forget where a senior, who was very much senior to me, who came to defend me, and then he safeguarded me. And I believe now, even now, we have a lot of seniors who will protect the interests of the juniors, and uh, permit the juniors to take their stand at the bar table. Thank you, sir. In, in, in fact, I was going to come to that a bit later, but now that you mentioned it, I think that's something that most of us as juniors look forward to, particularly uh, when juniors are being ridiculed or harshly treated by a particular judge or a bench. Uh, for, a, for a senior to, like all those stories that, that you've said, uh, lots of us, those of us who are coming down to the 40s and 50s have heard stories like this, where Seniors would come to their rescue and say, son, I'm going to sit next to you, argue your case. Uh, well, I think that we are very welcome, uh, welcome intervention, if I may say on behalf of the juniors, uh, if we had uh, more seniors doing that, uh, and, and that would be very welcome. Mr. Disilla, may I come to you, sir, now, on, on your unforgettable memory in, in, your, in your practice? Well, I, something. I mean, we, of course, have several things, but I like to touch on something that, you know, encouraged me a lot. I was against... Mr. H. Rodrigo, who later became a Supreme Court judge. And I was very young. And we argued the case and quite hotly. And it became the lunch adjournment. The judgment was reserved. And he came up to me and said, young man, 
I think you did very well. Congratulations. I never forgot that. And even now, quite often, I compliment not a not a seniors like you all, but compliment some of the youngsters if I see that they have done a good job in court. But that is an encouraging thing. And though that was an experience that I won't forget. Of course, I endorse what Ikram said just now that several of the seniors those days, you know, looked after the juniors and you know never let them down. Thank you, sir. So while you're on that point, may I also, uh, now that we share this light-hearted moment of things that we, we, we can't forget, un unforgettable memories. Sir, what, uh, can I ask Mr. Silva this and I'll come to the others also on the same point. So something that juniors uh, frequently uh, question is unlike, say, for example, in the United Kingdom, you, you get a pupillage uh, and there's a pupillage contract. There is a fixed assured amount that you get paid every month. Then you, if you move on to tenancy, you practice well, you get a tenancy contract. It's all, it's all very formal. Uh, even in the US, if you join a firm, you're, you're taken either as an associate, then you and you, you there, there is there is assurance of your of your tenure, uh, if you like, as, as a lawyer. But in Sri Lanka, uh, we are a far cry from that. Uh, as you said, some of us find places in chambers, but Although we sometimes fight for employers' rights and employees' rights and, and contractual obligations, as lawyers, uh, mostly a junior, uh, from a junior's perspective, is actually at the mercy of the senior. Uh, uh, Mr. Disila, if I can start with you. How do you see this situation and, and do you think there is room for improvement? And if so, how must we go there? Well, uh, I think uh, you have missed one point. That is... The firms, if you join a firm like Julius and Creasy or whatever, then you have security of tenure. You are not, you have a salary, you get that salary at the end of the month, at the end of the month, and you have security of tenure. You are not sacked overnight and you are not at the mercy of anybody. So that is one branch of the profession which still exists, which you can opt for. If you join the Attorney General's Department, again, it will be thing. you have security of tenure and you put it up and you have again. Now, the private lawyer whom you are really referring, like Ikram or Nihal or me, is completely different to what you get in the States or in England because this is a personalized practice. In England, if you join a chambers, the concept of chambers is different. The, a person, the client who comes to retain you, retains the, mainly the chambers. And in the old days, I'm not sure now, but in the time I was familiar, it is the clerk of the chambers who really, uh, who re really will allocate the brief. So the concept there is different. But here, if you retain Mr. Ikram Muhammad, you want Mr. Muhammad to be. You are not concerned about his junior. His junior may or may not be good. His junior may be even better, but you retain Mr. Mohammed. So it is a personalized. So when it is personalized, I don't think you can have security of tenure. I don't think you can have what you call tenancy because you are joining a chamber, which is not the, the word chamber is common to England and here, but the concept is different. In England, you go, you retain the chamber, the clerk will allocate the work. Here, so however eminent the top person in that chamber is, you can't retain him in that way. Here you come and you retain Mr. Ikram Mohammed or Faiz mm -hmm. Mustafa or Nihal Jaima, and you want that man to come to court. So it's a completely different concept. So I don't think we can borrow from England or the US here. But having said that, lots of people who have joined our ch chambers, in fact, stayed for lengths of time. And when they left, most lots of them left to a very good practice. And lots of them are doing very well now. So I think that concept we have to keep in mind. Yes. Thank you, sir. You're, you're, you're very right on that on that UK example. Uh, at times, it's said that in certain chambers, a chief clerk 
earns much more than a junior tenant. Yeah, of course. Because that's on a, on a retainer of the amount of work that they bring to chambers. So, yeah. uh, and, and, and that, that brings me nicely to my next question, which I'd like to pose to Mr. Mohammed. So now, uh, once again, when you when you compare that sort of practice where uh, they are the, the, the solicitor or the clerk can go and espouse work for the chamber. Yes. Now, here there is a junior coming to the bar. As Mr. Isla said, he joins the chamber. So there are the clients come primarily until he's a bit senior. The clients come for the name of the senior. Now, how do you see, sir, are, are ethical requirements here? Which, for example, now although we borrowed most of our practice from the United Kingdom, now they are, of course, subject to the difference between the barrister and the solicitor, which they still have. The solicitor can even put up advertisements. If you go to Tooting High Street, or I'm sure you've seen Wilson High Street, they they a personal injury done free, uh, no win, no fee. You don't pay me, I will do it for free. You, you, you can advertise your service as a lawyer. Now, here you have a junior struggling to make a living at the bar, at the bar, as Mr. Isla said, not in a company or not in the agency department, but at the bar. A raw junior coming. How, in, in your words, sir, how, how would you advise such a junior of making a name, but yet with the stringent requirement that we have now here? Now, I'm told that, that in, in one state in America, sir, there is a big billboard as you enter the state saying, kill and come to me, I will set you free. Now, I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean we should go that far. But, but advertising for even legal professionals is now accepted everywhere else. But we, are, we still can't. We can't even. Uh, I, I have seen some few comments here and there on Facebook. But other than that, you, you really can't advertise. How, what, how would you advise a junior coming into the bus as to how you make a name for yourself why is you within these restrictions? Now, in, in our country, we have we are restricted by the Supreme Court rules in terms of which we cannot advertise. But all of us have joined chambers as a, as raw juniors, and all of us working within the limits have come up in the profession. That is all what is necessary, as Mr. Mishri initially said, is hard work, commitment, and to be. And so Nihal said, to be, to be honest and honorable to you, so long as you do that, and with the assistance of the seniors, I'm sure all of us could develop a practice which we have done. And in that regard, I must say that I, the, the, the junior whom my, one of my juniors, who Mr. Ramit still was indicating, who joined me, and I, but he, but he was, he was from a rural area. I used to enter so almost, we had, bulk work I used to entrust many matters to him and within minutes he would read the brief and he would go to court and he was fearless to appear against anyone before any judge and he he got that opportunity grabbed the opportunity and 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 then he did well so that is what a junior must do he can a junior can't be fed in every way by a senior he can give a brief, but then he must make, you know how to make use of that and to grab that opportunity and to establish ourselves. All of us, that is how all of us have come forward. Now, even the present day junior, you know, they must be told and they must know their academic qualification is the basis, basic requirement to enter the profession. And you will you have got your intelligence to do well, but that is totally different from the professionalism that we exercise in court. So they must understand that. And all that is necessary is commitment. And Mr. 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 said, not to be worried about the fees initially. And, and then commitment, hard work. And no excuse. As regards the law of the land, you must study. And I myself has asked Mr. Ramesh on many occasion as to how Ramesh can I get about with this. And Mr. Ramesh has omission, always been very helpful. Therefore, if we don't know something and we cannot know everything, we must be humble enough to get the opinion from a senior or two and then to set the course properly because whatever we do is will not affect us but the political. So we must be humble enough to know our limits and to know what we do not know and to get the assistance of the senior or any other person, or do the reference, and to make sure that we, we, we do the correct thing in court. And then in the so second, yes, thank, thank you, sir. And also, 
we uh, must we must we must be i think in my view a lawyer must be quite humble enough to appear in court to respect the seniors is the first thing and to respect the judges is another thing and then never to talk bad about the judgments or judges after all, they exercise their their prerogative they give judgments and you must always humbly accept that and then respect the seniors and we were told never to go and sit in the front row but today the juniors you know as they would see a senior a senior still standing but what do they do they will be consulting on the book because if they recognize the senior or show that they know the senior they have to get up and give the seat so this is our profession is mainly dependent on high traditions there are noble traditions and our see juniors must know just because they are qualified and they wear the black gown or the black coat in the profession we have learned to learn a lot simply in the it romesh legri when our seniors came to the launch those days as when we are junior we will not even cross our links that is the respect that we showed our seniors not the very senior and whom you are but even any other senior so that is why we inculcate in our juniors not only respect us as seniors but respect every senior in the profession because today junior will be tomorrow senior and he has to take the responsibility and that is how the generations to generations the profession will develop and go so we have a I, great, I, great responsibility to ensure that high traditions are carried on and maintained and followed in the profession thank you sir i think you touched a very important point i think mr disilla wanted to come in something i'll come to in a moment sir i think that's something wonderful as we are profession isn't it that any junior i have not seen any junior being turned away by a senior if you if you ask them sir on this point what do you think i should do i mean i i know i speak of personal knowledge from all three of you i have learned so much and i'm sure all other juniors have and you you are always never hesitant you never keep that jealously guarded you say you know krishna do this or don't do this i mean i i i've had that several locations where you all have told me so uh, so that's a wonderful part of our profession so mr rishla you want to come in with something on that right yeah while i agree totally i want to add you were talking of these advertisements i think it's good for juniors we ikram and i also when we started you had to decide whether you want the you are looking for the long term or you are looking for the short term if you are looking for the long term advertisements don't help you know you get people who are advertising cases are reported in papers that might help in the short term but never in the long term because in the long term clients know who is good and who is bad like when we go to a doctor we go because we want to get cured we don't like the man necessarily clients come to us not because they like us they want us to win the case if possible so if you are thinking of the long term advertisements don't tell socializing doesn't tell people have been said you know join this club join that club networking doesn't help because the public are not fools the public know and they will come to you if of course you are thinking of the short term then these sort of things help and you might make a lot of money or bon a deal or that sort of thing but in the long term that sort of thing will not help you will not build up a practice and you will never earn the admiration of your peers you know one of the major things for us and ikram and i we have like a mutual admiration but the main thing is to get the admiration of your peers that's the most difficult thing. but in the long term if you do your work as it comes if you work hard if you are dedicated and you don't exploit people you know i, I think you will succeed but in the short term of course that will not necessarily be the answer so i don't think this advertisements and socializing all those things will work well in the long term this small i am if i may come to you yeah especially if you can uh, keep up to your advertisement <laughs> you have to be you have to be good you can't be relying on your advertisement you have to deliver so unless you deliver you you don't you fail yes sir we are uh, uh, when 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 you are in interesting discussion particularly with the array of council like this time runs so we have to get to uh, uh, quite a bit more if i can uh, if i can quickly come to you mr jaman 
sir, this uh, your your part of that 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 I when I say old school, I don't mean your hair, but but uh, you you passed out as an advocate. You said, and 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 that's a time that there was a distinction in our profession between an advocate and the proctor. Now yeah, yeah. Uh, we that after all of us became attorneys at law. Sir, how do you see the the challenge to a young junior? Now, Mr. Disilla very uh, eloquently earlier pointed out to someone who might want to join the company. There are others who might want to go and lecture law. Hmm. Yeah, we have lost him. I think. Yeah, uh, Krishpal, I don't think we are. You have been uh, silenced. <laughs> Krishma, there's some. Yeah. Uh, Krishma, we can't hear you. Uh, I I am speaking. Uh, I don't know why. No, I Krishma, the last two or three minutes yeah. we didn't hear, so you have to repeat whatever you said. Right. Can you hear me now, sir? Yes. yes yeah, I can. Sorry, sir. Uh, uh, what I said is the, the distinction between advocate and proctor earlier. And everyone has now become attorneys at law. And, yeah. and as Mr. Dishman said, some, some, some stick to, say, go to a firm or join a legal office as, a, as in a company, or some may go to the agent department, or some may start lecturing. Uh, but then there are some of us who follow you and have jumped into the water and you want to take the long haul and swim at the bar. Sir, how do you, uh, Mr. Jayaman, how do you see this distinction now as a challenge to a junior coming in? How do they decide, look, is this something that, as, as all of you said, you don't look for money. And we have all learned that in your first few years, you don't look for money, you look for work. And you finish the work and you make good work and then money will come to you. All of you said that and that were very wise. But how do you, sir, as a junior coming in, how do they make the choice on whether they want to be at the bar or do they go elsewhere? How, how does one make that choice? Is it Aman? Yeah, because we, at the time, we took our oath. We either had became a lawyer and practice, there was no other alternative, very few. But now, there's so much of work for lawyers in the firms, in departments. Uh, they have a choice. Unlike us, at that time, they, they have a choice. So I think people who have entered law college, at the time they entered law college, they have already made up their mind that I am not going to practice, I am going to join a firm or a bank or a uh, corporation or whatever it is and become a legal officer there. Mm -hmm. They've already mm -hmm. made up their mind. There are, there are some others who say, well, I will practice. And they do practice and when, and most of them practice in the outstations because outstations, there's a lot of work now. A huge amount of work now by the, 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 by the fact that there are so many courts opening every year there are so many courts houses now opening at, at magistrates court level and district court level and even high court of high court and high court of appeal. There are so many courts houses are open. So there is a choice of practicing. I know a lot of people who are in some uh, district going to some other district and um, putting up camp there and practicing and very successfully. So they have a lot of choice. And uh, the other aspect remains the same. If you want to be a practice, well, you, want, you, you know what, what you have to do. You know what you have to do. If you have to practice, well, you have decided to practice law, then you know what you have to do. You have to work hard and, you know, impress. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, things have changed so much and they are changing so fast every year that, um, that the choices are expanding for, for, the, for the lawyer. For the lawyer, you don't have to even do anything to do with uh, legal work. There are lawyers who have been uh, employed as um, uh, in uh, PR. I mean, huh? Yeah. In the no, they, they are the head of, head of some some department doing something or the other, labor and things like that. So there are a lot of chances and they are doing pretty well. So uh, my I, I actually I can't advise. I, as you said, what do what do I have to say? I have nothing to say. It is their choice. It is yeah. their choice. 
Yeah. If I can build on that uh, and, and pose this question to both Mr. Mohammed and Mr. De Silva as both uh, uh, eminent lawyers as well as being uh, heads of our bar. Uh, so if I can start with you, Mr. Mohammed, uh, building up on Mr. Jai, what Mr. Jayaman said, that old courtroom advocate, you know, uh, you know the wigs and gowns and uh, that, that old mudalali that came from the village, you say, say, our man shouted, you know, I'm very proud. Uh, the, gradually, our profession is changing, sir. And, and, and we have to accept that. Uh, people are not worried about hours and hours of advocacy and how well your man shouted in court anymore. The 21st century litigant uh, is only interested in uh, getting the maximum in the least possible uh, time and the least possible cost. Uh, and therefore, perhaps that's right, maybe if, even in, not in Sri Lanka, but at least in Elsewhere, uh, like other places that we associate, uh, there is no attraction to come to the bar as much as it was earlier. People tend to even sit at an office uh, without even a tie and a short sleeve shirt and do a merger and acquisition and earn millions, as Mr. Dishila alluded to earlier, uh, where, where the attraction to come to the bar uh, is diminishing somewhat. Uh, within that context, there is an argument that has been raised, particularly in the Sri Lankan bar, particularly from some of the examples that all three of you just said, where at the apex courts, where we, we are uh, sometimes, at, at most times, uh, where raw juniors sometimes even don't know whether to respect a senior or even to give a seat in the, at the inner bar or leave alone how to address the court. There has been this suggestion that, okay, everyone wants to be a lawyer. You finish three and a half years of law school. That's fine. But anyone who wants to come to the bar, there's an additional year, advocacy, only advocacy where you're trained to, the, to be at the bar, even a few dinners, if you like, like put like, like they do at the Inns of Court there, where you're, you're, you're trained certain etiquette and ethics that's required of you as counsel at the bar. That goes beyond your legal training. What is your opinion on that? So I'll come to you also, Mr. Disilla, because I'd like to get both your ideas on this. Uh, Mr. Iqbal Mohamed, if I can start with you. Yeah, I, I think, uh, Krishna, what you say is a new concept uh, which is being taught about. But I must say, but without, without such training, we have, we have also enjoyed the profession quite successfully. All what we have to learn is to see our seniors, how they conduct, and we can, that is the, that is the best course of study. Because this art of advocacy and as to how you must conduct yourself cannot be learned from books or from universities. The best study is in court. How to see? Now, for example, in that case, if I would mention Ramesh, who commands such a wide practice, I would say when he starts a case, his voice is so soft, which cannot be even heard by the judges at times. So he, there he waits and he sees how the judge is reacting. And then you can see his tone going up, comes to a point where he controls the court. That. So that is what you know, you must, you must see at the you know, without any other experience, if you see the senior as how seniors conduct themselves, how they address court, the language they use, and in consequence, how they in consequence, how do they, how will they follow the judge? Judges thinking as he got the witness in the box, and then they raise their voice, they frame their questions in that way. All these things cannot be studied from any book. All what is necessary for a junior to see the senior. And in my own experience, I would say, and I'm very proud that most of the, my seniors have succeeded in the profession. And not that I have given them, the all, always I have given them cases on from which you, know, you can, uh, they could uh, develop, but they have seen as to how seniors conduct, and then they are with you, then they are respected by judges, they are respected by our seniors, and gradually they build up a case or two with ex parte, small inquiries, and they, they conduct the, way, the case the way the senior has conducted. And it is, it is how most of my seniors and Mr. Ramesh's uh, junior, they have built up a practice. But overall, I will agree with you, if the, if the juniors can be given at least a, a course, you know, even after joining the bar, as to how you must conduct. Because the other day we saw someone in the Supreme Court saying, uh, the the goat gave the date, he said, uh, it's okay. Or he said, yeah. So these are not the languages that our profession is used to. And it doesn't look nice. So uh, we add, and, and you can't blame our juniors also. 
but uh, they yeah, must they be told, they must be taught, or at least they must look at the seniors and learn. So I am in agreement with you, Krishna, to say that if our juniors can be given a course uh, in ethics and as to how you must conduct. And now I believe the Bar Association has by several of these uh, lectures, they have they are teaching the juniors which uh, was not which were not taught to us at that point of time. We learned only by seeing our looking at our seniors. And also in that context, I must say our juniors must have the patience to sit in a courthouse, even if they have no work, see how the court is functioning, see how the seniors are conducting cases, see how the witnesses are being consumed, what is the way the witnesses give replies and how it is tackled by the judge. So we must have a lot of patience. And when you begin a practice, you have all the time to be seated in court and to watch for some time, which our people juniors don't do easily. So I will advise all the juniors, please take some time off to go and sit in a court and where we have seniors conduct the case in all these courts, just to watch as to how they conduct and how then how they attract the judges and what do they do so that they, they are, you know, they are respected in court. You, the moment you command the respect, then you have, you are, you, you are, your process in court is much easier. But none of the juniors in the present day, they go to a court just to sit and study the court practices. So I would uh, urge our juniors with all their academic qualification to be seated in a court when they have no work and study the court practice, the conduct of the cases, and to, to see how these things are done by seniors. What a senior has achieved over a passage of time, a junior can't achieve in a day or two. This is not a provision, you know, which, which you can come to the top for overnight. But you must have patience. So you must have commitment. And in the, in the course of in the, what I mean, commitment is not only studying the briefs, but also you must see as to the conduct of lawyers and the manner in which we, we practice in court. So that the juniors must do uh, more than anything, in my view. Thank you, sir. Um, come to Mr. Disla with that same question. But before you do, you strike a very uh, strike, strike very poignant note, sir. Uh, I remember uh, on a personal note, when we were apprentices, while we were watching all of you here in, in our courtrooms, I think some of you know that I was also a steward at Sri Lankan Airlines at the time. I used to carry an old corduroy jacket in my suitcase when I went on London flights and then go to the Royal Courts of Justice, sit there and just watch what the advocates did. Uh, and, 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 and that we learn a lot. We learn a lot. Not that I could have anything to do with that courtroom. But you learn even a lot from seniors, that. Even as senior, we still learn. Mm -hmm. You learn, you learn a lot. Mr. Disila, may I ask you also to come in on that? On, on... Well, uh, I was going to be like the our Supreme Court judges. I was just going to say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree totally. <laughs> I agree totally. I think uh, that all that is what we imbibe. The point that I disagree is I don't think this can be taught by the bar association or others giving lectures on ethics. Lots of people listen, but then don't imbibe it or take it in. So as Ikram correctly said, I think that these have to be learned. For one thing is you have to have it in you, as Nihal said earlier on comes from your family, your upbringing, your school, and that sort of thing. And you have to observe it and get it in that practice. So I agree totally with what Ikram said. I don't want to repeat. The only point that I slightly disagree is I bit skeptical about these lectures on ethics and training and advocacy. It doesn't seem to work. Christmas so, I, I you have to I, told, I have to yes. Yes, be excused. I told yes, Mr. Sir. Rajiv story also. Yes. Sir, do you have to do thing. one question before you go or yes, do you yes, want sir. to really? No, if there's any specific thing I can answer. I will promise you can wait for a few minutes. Yes. Very quickly, sir. Very quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, I wanted to come to all three of you, but I'll ask you now, now that you, you need to leave. And we thank you, sir. Thank you for your very valuable time. You sir. So on this question of that you raised, as you started on the question of juniors and and the the, the rush for money the rush for earning money mr mohammed said that uh, and you i think you said that you were expected to give a, a draft in 24 hours 
uh, and Mr. Mohammed said juniors don't have the patience to sit in a courtroom and learn. Mr. Jayaman said something to the same context. Sir, juniors, we, we all accept that there are economic considerations. They need to live. Some of them get married after coming to the bar. They've come from the villages or the rural. We are lost to again. Can't hear Krishman. Yeah, we are lost you. <laughs> Krishman, you are... Technological problem. Yeah. I can't hear you, sir. Can't, yeah. can't, yeah. I can't, can't hear you, Krishman. Are you, are you getting a call? Are you on the phone? No, I, I, I can't get off. You I must be getting a call. Off. Yeah, I cut that off. I cut that off. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 did you hear the question? Uh, not really. You started Sorry. by saying that you had, people have to have patience and that yes, you sir. cannot be, you know, get money and you have to watch. But I didn't follow, the, you didn't come to the question actually. No, the, the question was, sir, how does a junior draw this balance? I understand. Of, the say, economic you know, restraints. Economic yeah, restraints. Junior, junior watching will understand that, that they have to wait their course. They have to wait the while. Go to courtroom, sit and learn be in chambers, do drafts. But at the same time, they also need to meet economic considerations. They may have got married and just come in to the bar. How do they balance this? Uh, I mean, I, I know that, that it's easy for us. All uh, all of us, have, uh, you, but all three of you, uh, have, have worked very hard to come to where you are. But where do you tell the junior as to, okay, this is where you start thinking of earning money. I mean, can you put a number of years to it? Or, or is it when the judge starts knowing you by name, some people have told me, when the judge starts calling you by name, that means people know you. Uh, where do you where do you tell the junior, okay, well, this is where you start thinking of earning money. Now you're, you're training. I mean, I, or I suppose training goes on for life. But Mr. Rizal, if you can just maybe give an idea to a junior as to where, does, where do you stop being a junior and, and start becoming a fee earner? Well, you can't, I don't think you can put a time frame. Different people have different ways, different people. Some are faster, some are slower. But I think it's good for everybody who comes into the bar, as you said, to swim in this, uh, in uh, advocacy, to know that if you take that choice, you are not going to earn money immediately. So if you are married, if you have other constraints, if you have to help your parents, if you have to support your sisters or brothers, then you can, this is not the profession exactly for you because it will take time. Unless, of course, you get a very good senior like BJ who used to always see that, you know, all these juniors got sufficient money. You are lucky like that way. If not, right. so you have to take the choice. But then, unfortunately, very unfortunately, this is not the profession for me. What to do? I mean, I'm not, it's not easy. I'm not saying that, but that hard choice is on hard reality. That's a fact. Can I can I come come on this? Can we release this? Sorry, sir. Can we release this before you start? Yeah, can you? Can we release Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Even before we started, I told Mr. Amrathore that I have to leave. So thank you very much to all of you all. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Jayaman. Sorry. Yes, please come. No, because you must understand in those good, good old days or the bad old days, uh, in the marriage market, a proctor <laughs> or an advocate was a, was a prime property. Prime property. So, in those days, if you become an advocate, especially if you are an advocate, you can get married to a very rich woman. <laughs> you can get married to so that is one other. So they, you can you can take your time quite easily. You can take your time in developing a practice or uh, or, or 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 anything else you want. So that was that was different. But now, if you see. You go to the matrimonial section of any newspaper. None of the none of the fathers or the mother want a lawyer as a son-in-law. <laughs> they want a businessman or something like that. You see, so our our value as we have devalued ourselves 
by our own conduct we have devalued ourselves so so that's another reason why why, why it is very difficult for a lawyer to start and make a living at the very beginning of his life so if you are um, anxious to get married soon then of course you are getting into another very serious difficulty so uh, i think it is a very a very sad situation i mean all of us should uh, all of us should be very sad that it has come to this type of situation where a young lawyer is finding it very difficult to find and meet it's very difficult some people get very frustrated some people never get off fit and become successful and and it's, it's a matter of luck i think for all of us it's a matter of luck it is luck plays a great part in this whole game at like in any other profession so uh, your question is very difficult to answer what is i mean how to how to how to get this uh, straightened out and be you know uh, equitable is a is a very difficult uh, issue i don't think it is restricted to our profession it is restricted to most uh, other activities that people are trying to make money to live and find that they can't make it krishna so on, on that point krishna can can i add a few words yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah krishna but uh, all the juniors i believe that we are conscious of the fact that juniors need some financial assistance in their yeah, when they start their practice no doubt that is why we as seniors we as far as possible see that the juniors get a fee we retain a one a junior or at the end we we keep we retain two juniors and then see whether they could be paid and at times i think we also share our fee with the juniors and where the client at times finds it difficult i am sure all of us have done we also as seniors in certain second we don't charge a fee we want the uh, fee to be paid to the junior because we are conscious of the fact they also have to live they have their children they have their wives when they go home they can't go empty handed so that i think we also as seen as senior we have a certain amount of responsibility to make sure that at least the juniors at your chambers or who are your juniors uh, earn somewhat uh, reasonable uh, income yeah? and uh, we as seniors i am sure all of us can we do that and we can ensure that they get uh, at least uh, something more than the normal junior who is but ikram struggling. ikram can i can i butt in now yes ikram how many young lawyers i have seniors how many people oh, have see, seniors yeah. uh, yes that question you is there the the lawyers Don't have I mean, seniors. They don't I have mean. seniors. Even in our stock, you find lawyers. I mean, how many people have seniors? Absolutely. You might have some. You know, the, uh, I might have some. Romesh might have some. Some mm-hmm. might have about twenty. Some people have about twenty juniors. But I don't know how they feed the fellows. But anyway, how many of uh, I know? Uh, I, know. Uh, I know. I think, I think are, that is something that also. We are talking about. We are talking about that lot. Yes, who are, who are who are who are left uh, without any. this is like said that seniors it is also our obligation to ensure i think you know wherever possible the bar association also must take some step to make sure that a couple of juniors at least for about year or two can be attached to chambers so that they can have some i don't know how it is going to work but uh, as far as i am concerned i can from my personal i could say yeah. i have done to a great extent uh, what i could do to the juniors but as yeah. neha says it is only the do junior who attached to your chair yeah. yeah maybe about 80% of the uh, lawyers young lawyers don't have uh, they don't know senior they don't know i mean how can they sir, just go and say you know sir, sorry to sorry to cut in but uh, we 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 surpassed our hour and i've been very kindly told by the organizers because the the discussion is interesting we can go on for a few minutes more so if i can just wrap up with one final question and uh, thank you very much for the suggestion uh, and miss going back to just very quickly what miss jayamana said so i don't know whether i could 
whether you could hear me earlier, there was some technical problem. Uh, a, a, a few years back, I was invited to speak at a current affairs program at my old school to the present student. And, uh, and after the two periods of lectures, I asked how many of you want to be lawyers? Uh, and there was none. There was none. <laughs> they all picked medicine, engineering. Uh, lots of people went, uh, said IT and other corporate areas. But there was no one out of about 120 students. There was no one who wanted to come to the bar. So, so there, obviously, as Mr. Jayamanda said, sir, that I think we need to also turn an inward eye and look as to where we may need to change or how to make it more attractive. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. after, after your, your vintage, that cream goes off, then maybe a few of us will be left to wander along. But after that, what is it that we leave for the youngsters that come to the bar is a question that I think is very opportune that we must address. Now, sir, on that, last, on, on, on that point, I'm going to come to the last question which I'm going to pose to the both of you, uh, and I think it's a good question to finish on. The general sentiment, sir, lots of lawyers' jokes, no? Most jokes are about lawyers. They say, uh, what do you do with 100 lawyers? You chain all of them and throw them to the middle of the uh, bottom of the sea. They say lawyers are liars. They say lawyers are liars. Sir, well, you know, we, we, we uh, and there is, a, there is a reason for this sentiment for people to say. Uh, they, we have an overarching duty as an officer of the court not to lie to court. We also have a duty to our client to do the best for the client. In your opinion, if I can start with Mr. Mohammed and then go to Mr. Jayaman, uh, in your opinion, why is this sentiment that lawyers are liars? And what can we do in our conduct, particularly the juniors following you, to show that that is not the case, that, that we have a duty, but we don't lie for money? How do you come out of this, sir? I'll pose it to both of you, starting with Mr. Mohammed. Yeah, no, but although there is a sentiment to that effect, in reality, I think most of us as lawyers do not, in fact, lie. In fact, do, most of us do not. We represent the matters to the best of our ability in the interest of our client. But the person, that, that obviously, when there is litigation between two, one party has to lose and one party has to win. And the sentiments to the party who wins or loses is to say that the person had to lie to court and get a victory. But in reality, we know even the, the, the lawyer who on the losing side would know, in fact, what the, what the other person done is not wrong. If we have appeared and in case that we have lost, we have never made allegation that, you know, they, that was a false case they presented. But judges are smart enough to see through which is which and what is correct, what is truthful. And unfortunately, although we have the, that, that, that uh, we are described as lawyers are liars, I think reality is not so, but there will be a few lawyers, very few lawyers, handful of lawyers who could be said to be liars. And that, that such, such people are found in all professions. But as a whole, I must say, Lawyers are not liars, and lawyers, for example, you take the medical profession, you see how many doctors are fighting with each other. That should we don't have such things in the profession. As Mr. Romesh Silva said, we, we fight the lawyer very hard within the court premises, the court presence of the court, but when we leave, we are the best of friends. So I, that is a misnomer, a misconception. Or, uh, I don't know how it has developed. That's, that has developed perhaps as a joke. But I, as far as I am, my practice is concerned, we have, we have, we have done our profession without. Uh, I don't think that we have to lie anything. May, maybe you know you stress on something more than what ought to be done. But we don't as a whole lie. But there can be a, a very very small fraction who put and you can't help it. Every profession you get. And when a person lies also, it is seen by the judges very often. Not that, you know, very often, you know, it doesn't, it, it won't go unnoticed. But I, therefore, I, although how this joke said been there for centuries, lawyers are liars. You can't trust lawyers. Uh, they, are, they are people who compromise with others. But we know as, a, as practitioners how hard we fight for the cause of the client. At the next day, to an extent, we even I have seen lawyers passing personal remarks against each other for the sake of the 
cause of the client. And that is the spirit in which we practice. And I don't think as a whole, if you think, even 98% of the, I would say, not even 2% of our profession, the, the, the members of our profession who would do something, something contrary to their ethics and against the interests of their client. We fight very hard. And when we leave courthouse, we are together with them. And this Indeed. is Indeed. very unfortunate that, that that impression is there. And also, they Indeed. also say lawyers are like sharks. Yeah. They only grab That's money. Right. So we yeah. know yeah. in practice how much uh, of uh, concession we give to our clients, yeah. unlike any other profession. Yeah. Yeah, we very often we have appeared, not in one case, but from the beginning till the end. Pro deal. Oh. And that is the normal conduct the, of the honorable conduct of uh, the members of the profession uh, as a whole. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jayamana, may I ask you also to come in on that? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, that the jokes on lawyers are jokes. Nothing more than jokes. Right? Because it's easy to make jokes in this particular situation. The respect uh, lawyers have, I think, is is generally far supersedes the the, yeah. the, the, bad, uh, the bad which is said about the profession, our profession. Uh, they know that we do a, a service and we uphold the law, we uphold justice, we make sure that uh, the last bastion is the courts. We make make we make sure that that is the case. And for that, I think people respect us and we don't have to worry about. These are jokes. And these jokes are, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you make jokes about the, 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 the Pope, the bishops, the, the judges. Judges are the butt end of several jokes. Several jokes. So they're, 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 these are these is just for humor because people like when lawyers are made... Uh, made fun of that is Thank true uh, on, on, that, on that note uh, I, I think I, I really uh, need to hand us back to our organizers and may I thank uh, particularly uh, Mr. Ramesh Silva uh, Mr. Nihal Jayaman Mr. Ikram Mohammed, President's Council for spending of your valuable time uh, for, for taking the time to speak to the juniors uh, and and uh, that, that wealth of knowledge put together, uh, I don't think you can put a price on it. Uh, also, Mr. Srinath Pereira, we very fondly remember him, although he couldn't join us today. We wish you all the very best, sir, and for a speedy recovery. And we look forward to seeing you at, uh, at another uh, for us soon. Umayangani, before I hand you over to uh, hand over to you, uh, since the name was mentioned several times, the late, the great Dr. Colin R. De Silva, who, by the way, never took silks, I'm told, uh, and then since this last conversation about lawyers and what we do in court was said, uh, sirs, I, I'm reminded of the story that was told to me by my senior, that in his deep booming voice, when uh, uh, young state counsel challenged Dr. Colvin, said, my learned friend doesn't know what he's saying, he's lying. Uh, the reply was, my lord, with the utmost respect, I don't know what I'm saying because I was not there. My learned friend doesn't know what he's saying because he was not there. And with the utmost respect, even your lordship doesn't know what he's saying because your lordship was not there. We bring these two stories to the courtroom and we put it on the two sides of the scale and the weight of evidence is balanced and a judgment is given. Now, I tried to put as much deep voice to that as possible. I'm sure it was not as good as Mr. Call, Dr. Colin Adesilas. But thank you very much, Umayangani, for you, the Rajiv, uh, Pasindu and the organizing committee for inviting uh, the three seniors and honoring me with the opportunity to moderate the session. I hope uh, the juniors watching and everyone uh, had a good time. So with that, I uh, having thanked all of you and wishing the bar and your, your committee the very best, I hand you over to uh, Umayangani to conclude the proceedings for the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris Mahal. Thank you. Thank sir. you. Thank you, Mr. Varna Surya. Hello again, everybody. Uh, I will not ramble on and spoil the brilliance of today's webinar, uh, but thank you all for joining us this evening. I can undoubtedly say today's webinar, uh, or better yet, today's discussion, 
on the illustrious journeys of our legal luminaries was one of the most enjoyable webinars or discussions we have had. I'm sure uh, it was insightful and it did and will encourage the members of our audience. I'm glad we had so many participants joining in today uh, and to have such a colorful panel. I wish to thank our panel of eminent speakers, Mr. Ramesh De Silva, President's Council, Mr. Nihal Jayamana, President's Council, Mr. Ikram Mohammed, President's Council, and of course, our moderator for the evening, Mr. Krishmal Varnasuriya, Attorney at Law. Uh, thank you for taking time off your very busy schedules on a weekday evening and making a valuable contribution to today's celebratory webinar. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, have a good night. Stay safe. Take care. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you, Mangani. Good night. Thank you. Good thank night. you.